Office of, it, of the Administrator at NASA Headquarters. Crystal has served as, um, you have had almost as many um, jo jobs as Alan Ladwig. <laughs> Crystal served as Deputy Chief Engineer for Program Integration and Operations in the Office of Chief Engineer. Before that, she worked in the Office of Earth Science as the Associate Director for Exploratory Missions. I think that's where I met you. Where she managed the formulation and development for all exploratory missions and was involved in mission development activities with Goddard, JPL, Langley, and several international and industry partners. Crystal. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good morning. All right, they're quite awake this morning. That's great. Well, we are in for a treat this morning because I am betting that this session is certainly not going to be lacking in intrigue. Protecting our home planet, of course, is near and dear to all of our hearts. And when, the, when we're asked the question, what are some of the biggest threats to our safety and our way of life here today on this planet, two of the things that are high on everybody's list are near-Earth objects and the collisions with those and space weather. So this session this morning is going to have three different segments. To it. The first segment, we're going to have our first two guests here, Dr. Ahern and Dr. Tom Jones, talking about near Earth objects. And then we're going to have Michael Hess and Bill M M Murtaugh talking about space weather. After that, the third segment is going to be we're going to open it up for questions and answers because our panel is looking forward to engaging you all in a question and answer session. So let's get this party started. We're going to dive right in with Dr. Michael Ahern. He's a professor and astronomer at the University of Maryland, and he's developed a variety of observational techniques to study the structure and composition of comets. He and his students and collaborators have developed a system for surveying abundances in many comets. They've also developed techniques for determining sizes of cometary nuclei, combining optical and infrared measurements. He's carried out spectroscopy in many wavelengths to study particular molecules in comets. Asteroid 3192 was named after Dr. Ahern for his contributions in the field of cometary science. He's also the principal investigator for NASA's Deep Impact Mission and Epoxy Mission. One interesting factoid about Dr. Ahern is that he's appropriately nicknamed Captain Astronomy. And that's because instead of being here on this stage with us and in the company of all of you, he would rather be out sailing the high seas. Can you believe that? No. <laughs> He has, he keeps his boat and a commercial Coast Guard license in his home in Maryland, and he also has held a commercial trucking license. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Michael Ahern. And I also wanted to uh, live up to Harley's description of the uh, session uh, at the very beginning, but Maryland is not an open carry state. <laughs> uh, if we can move on. <laughs> uh, so this is what I'm here to talk about. Um, and in large part, my talk will be based on a National Academy study that preceded the task force that Tom Jones will be was on and we'll be talking about. We tried a very narrow charge on how to defend planet Earth from uh, NEOs. Uh, the next slide shows the other extreme. The dinosaur killers come every 100 million years or so. Every two, uh, 200, 250 years, you get a Tunguska-like event which flattened every single tree over 2,000 square kilometers. So those are fairly frequent. You know, they don't have as much impact on the Earth, but they are much more frequent. And the next slide shows the, uh, is there a pointer on here? The top up. Well. Not right here. It's low okay. <laughs> just push the button you were pushing. It's just you have to be there you go. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Uh, so this rep is, just represents the size distribution of uh, near-Earth objects. The red line is the observed ones, and uh, all of the other ones are the are the are the uh, modeled population. Bottom scale in green is the size in kilometers, 100 kilometers over here at the right, 
10 kilometers, 1 kilometer, 100 meters. And to put this in context, the Space Guard survey was charged with finding 90% of the ones bigger than 1 kilometer. The George Brown survey, which Congress has mandated but hasn't funded yet, uh, is supposed to find 90% of the ones down to 140 meters down to here. Tunguska is way down here at uh, 30 to 50 meters. Okay, so uh, the planned surveys won't even get us to the uh, uh, Tunguska type objects, which are the most frequent. Here, here's how often you get an impact of different size objects. Uh, this is the interval between impacts, uh, and if we get down here, there's 100 meters, there's 50 meters, there's Tunguska, it's up here somewhere, and it's every one, 200 years or so. There's Tunguska. Here, this is the dinosaur killer, the Cretaceous tertiary uh, boundary impactor. Uh, and they happen every uh, 100 million years or so. And it's been 65 million. Uh, okay, so finding them, just a couple of points. It's cheaper to find them from Earth, but it's faster to find them from space. That's all it comes down to. What sets this hazard apart from all other natural hazards is that you can buy an insurance policy which doesn't reimburse you after you get killed. It prevents you from being killed because we actually in principle know how to do the uh, protection from these objects. So it's very different from most natural hazards. Um, do you want to be protected in seven to ten years which uh, by finding them all from space or are you willing to wait 20 years to be protected, finding them from the ground. That, that's a cost-benefit trade-off that the Congress is paid to make. The, uh, it's, if, if, as long as you're in space, infrared is better than visible. And uh, the mandated survey from Congress, which they have not funded, is 90% of everything greater than 140 meters. Now, there's a lot of approximations that go into what, what's a 140 meter object. I'll ignore those. Um, if you want to understand the impact, you have to combine the frequency of the event with the number of people killed in an event. So we use kill curves. Uh, and the red line is just the, whoops, whoops, wrong button. The red line is the cumulative uh, kill curve. These are the global impacts. Uh, everything bigger than about two kilometers is a global impact. So basically you kill everybody on Earth. Uh, and recent developments uh, on Tunguska studies have said that uh, pretty small ones down here, uh, come on, come back, there we go, pretty small ones down here uh, kill a few people and basically you number, you have to multiply the uh, number of events by the number of people killed uh, and the left hand side uh, talks about fatalities per event. Uh, what you really care about is fatalities per year. Ignore the blue data. Uh, look only at the red data and most people are killed by big ones. Now this is averaged per year. Okay, so that takes out the uh, frequency of impacts. And uh, the big ones are the hazardous ones. We found most of the big ones. Uh, so that's what it looks like today, the one on the left. Uh, if we get complete, but it's still the big ones that uh, are dominating here. The big ones are still dominating here. Uh, this ignores comets. It ignores comets for two reasons. Number one, at this point they're still unimportant. And number two, we're not quite so sure what to do about them. <laughs> uh, if we complete the George Brown survey, that's the resultant curve. And now the smaller ones become more important, or at least as important as the big ones. Uh, but now the other issue is that the long period comets that are ignored are 50% of the problem. Uh, you've got to keep that in mind, uh, that the next stage beyond the George Brown survey, it's the comets that matter. Mitigation is the thing that interests me. How do you deal with this? How do you actually prevent people from being killed? You can use evacuations. We have a lot of experience evacuating in front of hurricanes. I won't comment on how good that experience is, but we have experience. Um, 
The most, the widely touted scenario for a number of years was a slow push-pull. The, the gravity tractor was the dominant thing. It turns out that has a rather narrow range. It's almost completely independent of the asteroid properties, but it acts very slowly, so you need a really long warning time. You, you basically use the gravity of a spacecraft to pull an asteroid. That's a pretty weak pull. Uh, you can do a kinetic Im impact. We demonstrated the capability of doing that with the deep impact mission, uh, but deep impact was too small to change the orbit in any measurable way. Uh, or you can use a nuclear blast. And nuclear blasts, a standoff blast is what you want. And that's the way to get uh, massive overkill if you have to do something at the last minute. This uh, just illustrates roughly the re regime of applicability, uh, plotting uh, the size of the impactor uh, versus the amount of warning time you have. You know, anything up to a Tunguska size event, you could probably evacuate if we had really good evacuation procedures in place. Gravity tractor is good for small ones with long warning times, at a minimum of several decades. Uh, kinetic impact is good over this whole region here, and anything up there is nuclear. The warning time is short. You better have something ready to launch. The point of doing the surveys is to get long warning time, so you don't have to have something ready to launch. Uh, the recommendation on what you should do next, aside from finding them, is doing a demonstration mission like the Europeans actually proposed to do seven or eight years ago and then backed off. They couldn't afford it. It's two missions. One is a rendezvous mission, which rendezvous with an NEO or with, a, with any asteroid or comet. NEOs are just ones that have been brought in close. Um, maps it out, does things like that, and then uh, you then do an impact and you use the rendezvous spacecraft to directly measure the change of momentum delivered to the asteroid because the momentum transfer efficiency is the big uncertainty in this business. We don't know what it is and deep impact was too small to actually measure that. Uh, a gravity tractor demonstration is a lower priority. Uh, it's hard to predict whether the uh, Next event is going to be a short warning time one where you need a big effect in a hurry or a long warning time where you can use a gravity tractor. Uh, but the bigger uncertainties, uh, all of the detailed uncertainties are in the uh, uh, impact approach. And it turns out that if you measure the momentum transfer efficiency, you get most of the key information you need to understand the efficiency of nuclear standoff blasts as well. Uh, so this mission was actually favored by the people who uh, work with the nuclear weapons. Um, uh, we listed a bunch of research needs that you uh, ought to uh, think about. Very top one, momentum transfer. That's what you need the Don Quixote mission for, is to actually measure the momentum transfer efficiency. Um, and there are a number of other things there. We didn't talk a lot about manned missions. We said we don't think you need men, but if you have men out there, or astronauts, or women, if you have astronauts out there, they can add a lot of science. But we don't think you absolutely need them for this problem. Uh, so if there's a reason for sending them there, we want them there. <laughs> okay? Because they will add a tremendous amount. But uh, we wouldn't say this is... A, a, the only reason to send them there. And we had a very narrow charter. We did talk about international collaboration. Uh, that's the track of Apophis in the early days before we realized it wasn't a problem after all. And if you mitigate it, this is the, what you don't know is exactly when it's going to hit. It's easier to predict whether an asteroid will hit than to predict where it will hit on Earth because the big uncertainty is the long track uh, motion of the asteroid or the comet, either one. Uh, and depending on that along track uh, motion, you get uh, an error ellipse that is really a long skinny ellipse along this track around the Earth. The Earth turns around underneath the track of the asteroid. You do some mitigation, uh, you're going to move it along that track. And if you don't do it very well, you're going to move it from hitting the U.S. will hit it down if they think it's coming down here and if they don't do, we don't do it very well, it looks like it's going to hit Russia and the Russians are not going to appreciate that. Um, 
or vice versa. And that is the critical reason why this whole effort absolutely has to have international collaboration. So how much insurance do you want to buy? That's the bottom line. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be Tom Jones here. Tom Jones is a scientist, an author, a pilot, and a former NASA astronaut. He holds a doctorate in planetary sciences and in more than 11 years with NASA, flew on four space shuttle missions. On his last flight, Tom led three spacewalks to install the centerpiece of the International Space Station, the American Destiny, the American Destiny Laboratory. He spent 53 days working and living in space. After graduation from the Air Force Academy, Tom piloted B-52D strategic bombers, studied asteroids for NASA, <coughs> in, uh, studied asteroids for NASA, engineered intelligence gathering systems for the CIA, and as a NASA, NASA contractor, developed advanced mission concepts to explore the solar system. In the writing of his book, Hell Hawks, which is a true story of an aerial band of brothers flying the P-47 Thunderbolt in Europe in World War II, he has interviewed dozens of World War II vets, and he stays in contact with them even today. His plea to all of you today here in the audience is if you know any World War II vets, please encourage them to document their activities, their contributions, to annotate their photo albums so that they can be shared with family and with their countrymen. It's important that we don't lose the record of their contributions to our freedom. Please help me welcome Tom Jones. Thank you, Crystal, and good morning to everybody. It's great to be with you, with you inside today rather than outside. I thought it was going to be a more spring-like uh, event that we'd be convening for, but it's great to uh, be in this warm room with all of you. I wanted to build on what Mike uh, introduced you to in the, in the realm of planetary defense and talk about uh, planetary defense and neo-exploration. And of course, we're talking about uh, exploration, both robotic and human. That seems to be on NASA's agenda these days. And so I'm going to walk you through a set of ideas about why it's important that we have a very strong search program, as Mike outlined, for uh, near Earth objects, both to protect our planet and also to um, uh, provide us with the opportunity to turn this hazard into a bonanza for both science and for uh, human exploration and human expansion into the solar system and eventually the economic development of space. So let me walk you through these uh, ideas. I was uh, lucky enough to be on a, uh, an ad hoc task force on planetary defense last year that was convened by the NASA Advisory Council. And we had seven members on the council. Uh, we turned in our report in October of last year. Here are the, the council members. We had seven members uh, drawn from uh, the near-Earth object science and uh, planetary defense communities. Mm -hmm. And Rusty Schweikert and I were the co-chairs of the uh, task force. And we had about six months to do our work. And we built largely on the work that the National Re Research Council panel did uh, in their report, Defending Planet Earth, uh, that came out about a year ago. So our task force um, uh, reported directly to the NASA Advisory Council and turned in our information to uh, the NASA administrator and have briefed him and a lot of the uh, associate administrators in the past uh, few months about the results of our panel. So let me go through some of the important results here um, from our panel discussions. Uh, the the first point is that search programs that we have today on the ground are rapidly increasing the rate at which we discover near-Earth objects. And as Mike mentioned, we found about 87% of the large kilometer-sized objects that can do in civilization or have global effects. And by accident, in searching for those big guys in the Space uh, uh, Guard survey, we found a lot of smaller objects. They number over about 7,500 or close to 8,000 near-Earth objects that we found, all the way down to a few tens of meters in size. Second bullet is that many potentially hazardous objects will have uh, something called a worrisome probability of impact. That was our euphemism for talking about objects that we think might hit the Earth, but we really can't be certain given our poor orbital knowledge of their trajectory. Um, what's the threshold for the concern there? Uh, what's going to worry you as you go to sleep at night? Is it, imp is it an impact probability of one in a thousand? Ten years from now? Is it one in a hundred? 
Is it one in 50? What will wake up a policy maker or a congressman or a president and say, we have to do something about this particular near-Earth object? Apophis, as Mike mentioned, you know, it used to have a high probability about one in uh, 3,000 or so when it was first discovered. Then it dropped rapidly, and now it's about one in a quarter million uh, for an eventual impact with Earth. So Apophis is a poster child, but it's off the radar screen as far as impact uh, probabilities go. But we're going to be discovering objects by accident in the years ahead, and then by purpose, I hope, with the Brown survey, that will make us sit up and take notice about the chances of them hitting the Earth. And the imperfect information that we have at the time we discover them uh, will carry on to the time when we actually have to make a decision. So the point here is that when a policymaker has to decide whether to deflect a near-Earth object, an asteroid or a comet, uh, they might not have the perfect knowledge that it's actually going to strike Earth and where it's going to strike. They may have just a number like 1 in 50 uh, that it's going to strike the Earth in 2029 or 2036 or 2052. So you might have to make the decision without perfect knowledge. That's a, 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 a fact uh, related to our telescopic capabilities and the knowledge of asteroid orbits. Next, uh, another finding that we had in our panel was that the deflection decision frequency, how often you're going to have to decide to deflect an asteroid in the coming years, is considerably higher than the actual rate at which they strike the Earth. And we already know that Tunguska's hit us every 100 to 500 years or so, uh, but we probably will have to deal with a lot more objects that could be at Tunguska in the years ahead, but will actually miss the Earth if you actually just did nothing. So what's that relative decision frequency? All we know is that it's higher than the actual impact frequency. 20 to 1, 50 to 1, 100 to 1, we don't really know. So if it's 10 to 1, then if we get stri struck every 250 years by a Tung Tunguska-class object, that means every 25 years you'll have to decide to do something about those objects to ward off public concern and prevent... Uh, the damage that might occur if the actual reality is that there is an impact. And finally, as Mike said, international leadership is needed. It's inevitable that when you shift the risk from one impact point to drag it off the earth completely, you're going to drag that impact point over somebody else. And if uh, you don't think that that's an international problem, then you haven't um, sat around through the discussions that uh, the UN has promulgated on, on neo uh, impact over the last five years or so, which I've been a party to through the international um, discussions and the Association of Space Explorers. Now, we wanted to emphasize in our work that the NASA activity dealing with near-Earth objects, you know, it's exploration, it's science, it's potentially planetary defense. It's a three-dimensional activity. And if you might... Uh, uh, add a little bit of resources to uh, other space missions for science or for exploration precursors, then you get a large increase in the planetary defense knowledge. So a small investment can go a long way. And a good example of that is if you've got a science mission that's already going to a NEO, then uh, you can have it demonstrate proximity operations for a gravity tractor. Or you can actually run a probe into it, as Mike has mentioned, for a kinetic impact demonstration. And those same investigations can give you big payoffs, uh, not only for science, but for planetary defense and human exploration. Uh, one example we heard from one of the AAs was that, hey, if I've got to add 10 kilograms of mass to my spacecraft to do a planetary defense uh, surface investigation, that might force me to go to a larger launch vehicle, but if that money is ponied up by a planetary defense budget line, then I'm happy to do that as a science manager. So we can get a lot of three-dimensional benefits by working together across directorates at NASA, not mine one directorate's budget money for benefit for another, but share the, the cost and then share the advantages that come in increased knowledge. Fourth dimension of NASA's NEO activity is time. Uh, if we are planning to send humans to near-Earth objects, we need to know up front a lot more about their surface properties, their rotation periods, their, uh, the difficulty in anchoring to such a low gravity surface. And if we can make those investments now, we will save a lot of money in the long run by having to duplicate precursor missions that we'd have to send 10 years from now, for example. So let's take advantage of science missions that will be in the discovery program and the books in the next 10 years, for example, to uh, eliminate the cost of duplicate flight missions. Um, integrating planetary defense into science and human exploration increases NASA's overall knowledge return. And that's a, uh, it's a money saver. And it meets the needs of managers, policymakers, scientists, and the public who expect us to manage our space efforts wisely and efficiently. All right, let me focus on just one of the five recommendations that 
that we made. We had five big ones. You can read about them in our report online. But number two was acquire essential search track and warning capabilities. Let me talk about that aspect. First, in the short-term warning abil uh, capability, we thought this was a big opportunity for NASA because if you take off-the-shelf telescopes that you can buy for one or two million dollars and put them into operation, they can stare at the sky and look for asteroids on their death plunge, their final approach to Earth. Uh, you'll pick up about 60% of the objects that will strike the Earth and create a fireball in the sky. They're not going to create a crater. They're too small. They're only the size of a pickup truck or the size of this table up here. But if you pick them up in the sky, like 2008 TC3, and tell the public about them, you know, you can provide warning if there's any kind of hazard that's uh, attendant with that impact. But you can also cue science investigations. You can go out and find the fragments of those objects. You can put airborne observatories into the sky and watch the breakup of the a asteroid and get a spectroscopic measurement of its composition. And you can also inform the public about the frequency, the frequency with which Earth is struck by near-Earth objects. And about 50 million objects, 10 meters in size, are in our Earth-centric space in the inner solar system. They strike the Earth about, um, oh, every 10 years, and they create a multi-megaton blast. So uh, once every day, one of those objects whizzes by between the Earth and the Moon. We don't know about that today. We're just ignorant of it. If you had a telescope system like this tied into NASA's uh, asteroid data system, uh, you could actually inform the public about this hazard and then elevate the level of interest of policymakers, for example. And it's pretty cheap, only a couple of million dollars to duplicate one of these off-the-shelf systems. Let's go on to uh, the larger problem of finding the hazardous objects that face us. Mike alluded to this uh, technique of space-based search. This is a beautiful diagram from Ball Aerospace. Here's the Earth's orbit right here circling the sun. You've got uh, the Venus orbit, which is in blue right here, and here's the planet Venus. The uh, donut of asteroids that might strike the Earth is in red and blue all around the solar system here, around the sun. And we only see this blue segment from our ground-based telescope staring off to the right into the night sky. And we're limited by how close we can look to sunrise and sunset. Uh, and we have clouds and, of course, bad weather, and the moon's in the way. So that limits the search, search efficiency from Earth. And finding 90% of the objects, 140 meters and larger, uh, will take us about 20 to 40 years at present discovery rates. You'll get there eventually, but it'll take a long, long time, and then we're vulnerable all during that time to some unknown object that might strike us. If you put a space-based telescope in a Venus-like orbit that's about 0.7 AU, which of course is on the inside racetrack and circles the sun faster than the Earth, it's available to look outward away from the sun in this orange segment, and it can see about 200 degrees of the sky as it makes its observations. It's only about a 50 centimeter telescope, something about, you know, the size like this. And that telescope would cost about as much as a Discovery class planetary mission. That telescope, in that favorable orbit, seeing not only the blue objects that we can see from the night side of Earth, but also the red objects here that are on the interior side of the Earth, and we never see them because they're in daytime. That uh, telescope is very efficient. And here you see the search time and years at the bottom. The uh, fractional completion of the search, we're looking for 90% of 140 meter objects. You get to 90% in about eight years of uh, observing time with this single telescope. And uh, you can actually see objects down to 60 meters to a similar efficiency you know, maybe 60 or 50 percent in just about five or six years. So we're finding a lot of objects very efficiently and not having to wait. And that can cue you to go and investigate some of these objects that you discover with Discovery class missions like the Amor robotic lander that I worked on last year with our proposal to the Discovery program. You actually find a lot more favorable targets by doing this, and some of those targets are like exactly the same ones you'll want to see for human exploration. And so here again, the same telescope in a Venus-like orbit uh, time in years on the bottom, looking at objects that are 60 meters across, pretty worthy of a human crew going to visit, you get to um, something like 80% discovery uh, in about two years of observing time with this telescope. And for smaller objects, which you might want to visit potentially, you get a, a higher fraction um, over about double that time. Maybe in five years or so, you get to the smaller object, the completion that you need. And this is very important for astronauts and astronaut exploration because the paucity of targets that we have today means that we're very, very limited in the objects that are accessible to human capable spacecraft today because of Delta V reasons and launch opportunities. And we need to have this capable space search to both cue us for planetary defense and also open up the decision space for 
neo-exploration, both robotic and human. And in this picture, in this slide here, I talk about how that neo-search of a few hundred million dollars, 500, 600 million dollars uh, over the course of the mission would do a lot to reduce the risk of exploration. Right now, if we talk about sending humans to NEOs in the 2020s, it's pretty much a blank slate about how we would do the, that mission and, and actually explore for a couple of weeks in a six-month mission at an asteroid. You know, when I flew on the shuttle, we had checklists for everything. Here's the ascent checklist for my flight on Columbia. It's very detailed in what we do on the way up to Earth orbit. Right now, the checklists for going to an asteroid are blank. So to fill in the operations flight data file or the checklists on EVA, the tools that we'll need, the science that we'll do and in place on the object, the rendezvous that we'll have to do and how you do proximity operations and descend to a, a, a near a zero gravity surface, all of those facts have to be filled in by the operations team and we would do that by having a search, queuing robotic explorers to go on uh, to uh, fill in the, those documents and that knowledge base. And as a manager, if you're looking at this NEO search, it's going to help reduce your operations crew and program risk. You'll be going into a much more known environment because we'll have hundreds of objects. We might discover over the course of the space-based search about 700 targets that are 50 meters or so or larger in size. And if you rule out the ones that are rotating quickly or have uh, problematic surfaces, you know, uh, unstable rubble pile surfaces, you might have 400 targets that a manager could choose from in the 2020s for his launch opportunities. So you'd have a more known environment by launching some robotic precursors to those new targets. You can prepare the operation skill set that a human crew would need. You would verify that the mission could be done within the crew's capabilities and keeping them safe at the same time. Uh, you, these, having more targets will mean that you'll be able to pick the ones with reduced flight duration, uh, lower mission delta V, and lower exposure to harmful galactic cosmic ray radiation, which is the long pole in the tent for deep space missions. And that gives you a lot of expanded program flexibility. If you're going to asteroid Crystal Johnson in 2025, but your program is delayed for technical reasons and you miss the launch window to Crystal, then you've got maybe three or four other objects that year that you can retarget to. We don't have that luxury that frequency of launch opportunity today. And we won't have it for decades with just ground-based search. And finally, uh, if you do a NEO search in support of human exploration, you're going to be able to talk to the public about how human exploration of deep space beyond the moon is tied in directly to human survival and the survival of our civilization. So um, I'd invite you to read further in our uh, as uh, Association of Space Explorers report called Asteroid Threats, which we gave to the UN in 2008, addressing the international decision making that's required for dealing with the NEO hazard. And of course, you can read the task force survey that I had up earlier in my uh, presentation. Our task force uh, report is on the web at the NASA Advisory Council website. And check into our website at the Space Explorers uh, uh, website as well. And I hope that this NEO search that I've been arguing for, that Mike has made a good case for, will see us on our way to the asteroids. We should do it by 2020, not 2025. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. We're going to switch gears now and focus on space weather. The first one up is Dr. Bill Murtaugh. Bill is a senior forecaster and customer focus representative for NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. He is also the principal point of contact for the National Weather, weather Service Space Weather Outreach and Education Activities. Bill works closely with private industry, national and international agencies, emergency managers, and government officials to ensure operational impacts of space weather are minimized through appropriate response and adequate preparedness. One interesting fact is just in case you notice a bit of brogue in his accent, Bill is in fact from the south, but it is the south of Ireland. Please welcome Bill Murtaugh. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. The, uh, I wanted to get one thing uh, straight right off the bat here, and that is the fact that the next solar maximum coincides with the end of the Mayan calendar is purely coincidental. <laughs> okay. if, you, if you could only understand the torment I go in our operations center from phone calls and emails asking me about that subject. So, um, What I want to talk to you, to you about today is um, uh, this whole issue of space weather and where it's come today. Um, to, I suppose 
let's kick things off a little bit of a definition of space weather. From our perspective and, and, and the requirements levied on us, we watch the sun. We're monitoring the sun for the radiation from the sun, whether it's electromagnetic radiation or particle radiation. And of course, of course, it's how that radiation impacts the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's ionosphere, and the technology down here on Earth. That is the, in, in, uh, in its very shortest definition, the, the space weather issue. It's uh, become very much an issue in the, in the last um, three, four, five years or so. You'll notice some of you might be saying, well, National Weather Service, how come these guys are National Weather Service? Well, National Weather Service is the, uh, has the responsibility to issue alerts and warnings and watches, as we all know, and we have that same responsibility of issuing alerts, watches, and warnings, but not for tornadoes or blizzards or hurricanes and the like, but of course for space weather, which is solar flares, the, uh, the eruptions on the sun, the geomagnetic storms, the solar radiation storms. So it was recognized that the operation alarm would be best in an operational agency like the National Weather Service, and that's, uh, that's why we are where we are. So what I want to talk about is a little bit um, why we're, we're so interested in this issue of space weather right now, what's happened in the last uh, couple, three, four years or so that's made this thing, uh, put this thing in the spotlight, and uh, I'll talk at the end then just uh, about some of the developments and some of the things we're doing in response to this threat. Now, on the plot, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solar cycle here in a minute, but you'll see the vertical axis there is the sunspot number. Some of you would recognize this. The next, the last solar maximum peaked in 2000, April of 2000. We've been in a prolonged solar minimum. Actually, it's been going on for the best part of four years. We've had a break of um, just, just essentially that, four years without any significant activity. I often wonder what the folks down at the Hurricane Center do during that period of January, February, March or so, and there's not much happening. I don't want to hear any complaining from them. We had to deal with it for four years without anything happening. So, But it was interesting, back in 2005, when we transitioned into the National Weather Service, we introduced this product subscription service. It was a way to um, reach out to our user base, our, our customer base, let them sign up for their own alerts and warnings, control their own account. And watch, look what happened over the course of, of that, from that point when we introduced the service in 2004 through the last five or six years when nothing was happening during the solar minimum. We've seen this dramatic increase in customers. We did wonder what would happen when we finally had an outbreak of space weather activity. That accounts for that spike right at the end. In fact, I just mentioned up there looking at the numbers for last month when we had some decent activity, we had over a thousand new subscribers. Now, the obvious question, what kind of, who are these subscribers, Bill? What are we talking about here? And this this is good because it'll just, this is just a sample from the last three or four months, and it gives you an idea of the diverse interest here, the diverse impacts, and the diverse nature of the customer base for space weather products. Of course, what you're going to see here is everything from communication groups, emergency response groups, aviation interests, regulatory and the major airlines, uh, nuclear power stations. John Deere and Caterpillar, what do you think they're there? GPS. $8 billion industry last year, the um, precision agriculture. It's interesting, the uh, Alaska DOT, I have to share this story, which I went up to Alaska back in September to work with our National Weather Service colleagues up there, and they brought a lot of the stakeholders in to talk to us, the Alaska Department of Transportation included, and this guy told me a great story, and it really brought it down to earth how important the space weather stuff is. The, uh, anyone familiar with Thompson Pass? It goes right into Valdez, a treacherous stretch of road in the wintertime, averages about 40 feet of snow or so. Well, obviously, it's closed to the public but they have to keep that open as much as possible. It's the only way into Valdez. So during these zero visibility conditions they bring out, the snow plows. But they're not called snow plows up there anymore. They're called smart plow. These guys are operating these plows with a GPS system and a radar system, driving at about 20 miles an hour without looking out the window. It's strictly based now on GPS. And the guy tells me, we've got a thousand foot drops on both sides, Bill. GPS has to be accurate. So when I get up there and I tell these folks that sometimes during these very big space weather storms that we see errors in GPS, sometimes the half the distance of a football field, these guys get really worried. 
So it's just it's just kind of an indication, and, and it's certainly uh, important to point out that this this whole customer base, as I show it to you here, the GPS piece is the one that is growing fastest. GPS pervades society today. There is so much interest and in so many unique applications for GPS that it's uh, I learn new stuff about that every every day. Um, not only just what's happening today. Of course, we look out to the future and what's happening in the next three, four, five, ten years or whatnot, and there's a lot lot of things happening, evolving technology, evolving customer base that's going to demand space weather services. Uh, the EHV is extra high voltage power grid behind the uh, picture there, is the power grid. Um, the, it's, it's, incre it's creating a new vulnerability in the power grid, the introduction of this, high, this extra high voltage equipment. The GPS, of course, I mentioned it's, it's very important now, and with the intro introduction of the European GPS system, uh, the, the uh, Galileo and the Russian GLONASS system and whatnot, it's, uh, it's just going to be uh, even a bigger issue. And uh, when the evolving customer industries, customers in industries, of course, commercial space enterprise now this is an interesting area with the uh, with the advent of the space tourism things here in the very near future Arctic economic development is a big thing space weather impacts the higher latitudes more than anywhere else so for whatever reason we do know that there is a big melt going on in the uh, ice cap and that may open up the uh, sea routes which would be very very significant and uh, obviously a lot of interest whether it's been mar for, for navigational purposes aviation over the polar regions uh, drilling up there, all relying on technology impacted by space weather. And of course, airspace management needs. We're looking at the introduction, the big improvement on the national airspace system is the next generation air, transport, air transportation system, which will rely on GPS almost exclusively for every phase of flight. Big issue, of course. I go back to Alaska, flying a plane into Juneau, if anyone's ever done that, the approach in there is pretty treacherous and they're using GPS exclusively now. They need to know, obviously, if there's going to be problems with the GPS system. And this is, a, you know, this is important for us, the growing awareness. Space weather has now become mainstream. This was the outbreak of activity that occurred just a couple of months ago, February last month, February 16th and 17th, and these were the headlines in mainstream media. So in some ways this is good, it gets the awareness out, gets the news out, but of course there's a, the downside. When people read, take, this, take the one on the um, upper right hand side, for example, the CBS Los Angeles, biggest solar flare in years headed for Earth. I mean, what does that mean to the general public? It scares the living heck out of some of them. So we have to be very careful of how, I mean, we, haven't, we have very little control, obviously, what the media is going to report, but um, just recognize that it's, it's, it's certainly now become very much mainstream. So talk a little bit about the solar cycle. We're expecting our next maximum to occur in 2013 time frame. It's a little bit smaller cycle than average, and that too has caused a lot of confusion. We're hearing from the Hill and other folks that get word of this and really don't know the details, and they'll say, well, Bill, isn't it true that the next solar cycle is going to be a little smaller than, well, it's going to be quite a bit smaller, perhaps, than anything we've seen in the last 80 to 100 years, and consequently, we may not see any significant space weather? Well, I always have to show this, because this is a nice plot of the solar cycles that date back to 1750, and the red horizontal dashed line there is the average. Now, you can see the last 80 years or so we've had been above or, uh, at or above the averages, but go back, see if it's go back to what, 1920, 1930, to, 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 um, to see uh, cycles uh, like, like what we're expecting in this next solar cycle. And so what? Well, you see the little circles around 1859 and 1921? That's when we had our biggest our space weather Katrinas, if you will. In the historical record, when we look back and see what happened, we recognize that the events that occurred in September of 1859 and in 1921, these were the biggies. And of course, the message here is they occurred with smaller than average cycles. So what are we talking? When we talk about a space weather Katrina, what does that mean exactly? Interesting to look at the um, 1921 storm. I'm a bit of a history buff, so I like to look back at this stuff. Here's the New York Times articles from 1921. Uh, the one all the way over on the left talks about the New York Central Railroad system below 125th Street put out of operation, followed by a fire in the central station. This was all due to the geomagnetic storm inducing electrical current flowing up into telegraph systems and whatnot and causing fires and whatnot. Now the other piece 
The visible manifestation of space weather, that lovely piece of space weather, of course, is the northern lights and the southern lights, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. Frequent, recognized frequently in the northern states and Alaska and whatnot. Oh, what do you think if it was visible in Samoa and Jamaica as it was in 1921? That's just an indication of just how intense that geomagnetic storm was. So people looked at this and they said they asked the obvious question. So something like that occurred today. What is it going to do to our technology? From an NRC report, the National Academies suggested that should, because of the interconnectivity of the grid, should we get a storm of that magnitude today, we could see a wide-scale blackout, electrical, electric power blackout in the areas inside that black line which of course encompasses most of the east and parts of the northwest, which would be hugely significant. It would be catastrophic to this nation. So, what are we doing about it? The, uh, this, high, this, is, this has garnered the attention across the highest levels of government. Just in the last four months, these bullets represent what's happened in the last four months. The SHIELD Act was introduced by, um, by Congressman Trent Franks just last month, Feb February 11th, in fact, to amend the Federal Powers Act to protect the grid against these geomagnetic storms. I briefed at the White House uh, on the 18th of February to the National Security Staff and OSTP. The President is uh, looking for a report on this threat. So it's very much on the radar of the, in the White House. The, uh, John Holdren, the senior advisor for, at OSTP for the president and his uh, counterpart in the UK, Sir John Beddington, uh, released an op-ed just uh, earlier this month on this threat of space weather in the New York Times. And coming up on the 11th of April, there'll be an in, in electric infrastructure security summit in the Capitol building. Um, Trent Franks will be there, Senator Kyle and others to address this issue. So just to give you an idea, at the highest levels of government, this is very serious and is being addressed. Within, a little more locally at our uh, own organization, these are some of the things we're doing. We're, we're transitioning models, the first physics-based models now into operation by the end of this year or into 2012. Working very closely with my colleague Michael Hesse here in NASA and the CCMC. He'll talk more about their activities here in a minute on uh, getting these models developed and into operation. So, of course, what do we want to do? We want to provide better predictions, more accurate predictions predictions so the power grid can take the necessary actions to protect the grid and prevent a catastrophic failure of the grid. Also, um, we continue to expand covers of the critical ob observations within NOAA, the GOES-R series and other uh, platforms, space and ground-based, that will be huge, um, hugely important for our, our efforts to, to ensure this, um, this, the security of, our, of our, our grid. So, I'll leave it at that. The, um, Technology evolution, of course, interconnectivity and interdependency of the grid and our reliance on space-based systems. That is what our day-to-day -day society is based on today. It's very fickle. If things go wrong, if we lose the internet, if we lose some of any satellite communications, it can have devastating effects on, on a lot of our infrastructure. So it's becoming more and more an uh, interest of concern to all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Hess. Dr. Hess started his career at Los Alamos National Laboratory as, director, as the director's funded postdoctoral fellow. He then spent two years as the principal scientist at Hughes SPX in Lanham, Maryland, and then found his way to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Hess is the lead co-I for theory and modeling of NASA's SMART, or MMS mission, and he's now the chief of Goddard Space Weather Lab. Dr. Hess is the director of the Community Coordinated Modeling Center, which he, Bill just mentioned, a multi-agency project aiming at the creation of next generation space research and space weather models. Just this month, in only a few hours before a gigantic bubble of electrified gas and charged particles erupted from the sun, Dr. Hess and his team officially released the new space weather app for all of our iPhones and iPads, and, and making its way, it made images and other data almost immediately available to all users, everybody who has an iPad or an iPhone. Of course, that eruption was a fast-moving coronal mass ejection that raced through space at 1,200 and 42 miles per second. The good news is that it did not strike the Earth. It made a glancing blow, 
bearing our satellites, power grids, and electrical transmission lines, but it did trigger a run to the iTunes store. And within just a couple of days, 1,500 users had already downloaded the application, making it one of the store's most 20 popular applications in the space weather category. Also, Mike, uh, Mike Hess has a passion for sailing, so we have another sailor in the, in the panel. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Michael Hess. Yeah, thank you very much, Crystal. Um, so, uh, you, you just heard a very, very nice introduction to uh, space weather hazards and their, their uh, various aspects. So, what I want to do here is show you what uh, what's being done about that at, at NASA. Specifically, if you're looking at the elements of uh, space weather forecasting, if you want to construct a space weather forecasting capability, you need to look at a set of uh, uh, charges, if you like. Uh, first of all, you need to accumulate knowledge. You need to uh, know how to describe the system to understand the system. Uh, you need to research the effects that, that you want to uh, predict. Then you need data and information, typically from space missions or from ground missions. Uh, uh, and you need models that you can then deploy to predict uh, perhaps based on that information, and you finally need to disseminate that information to anybody interested in, in using it. And what I want to do throughout this presentation is uh, pr uh, prove to you that NASA activities basically play a uh, the key role perhaps in, in all of these aspects. So let me move on. Starting with uh, research and, and uh, data and information, a key provision, uh, information provider for space weather remains uh, the NASA ESA SOHO mission, which is sitting at the L1 point, uh, uh, looking at the sun uh, and uh, providing us information about eruptions on the sun like you see here in this movie. This is a very time compressed movie that shows you uh, during solar max uh, a whole number of eruptions together with the impact of energetic particles that are generated along with that uh, that you see occasionally this hash on, on, on the imager here. Along with that these energetic particles are also measured on board here. You see an, uh, measurements during a recent event where uh, levels increase. We're looking here at uh, energy levels up to 50 million volts or something like that, uh, which is quite hazardous to humans and their assets in uh, space and, and uh, uh, indirectly through the impacts also on the ground. So this remains the prime solar observatory at L1 uh, Look with a coronagraph. So let's move on. Uh, the next missions that you want to mention here really which are critical for space weather and, and useful in a way that has uh, really uh, opened up new ways of, of dealing with space weather problems uh, is the stereo missions. These are two spacecraft which were la launched in 2006 uh, which are in orbits that I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, the important thing about these two spacecraft, as they're looking at the sun, they're continuously providing beacon data, which is data at a lower than science quality uh, data rate, but which is extremely useful for space weather analysis. And why are they so, so particularly interesting? Well, that's because of the vantage points that they provide. You can see that here, this is an Earth-centric system here. The sun is here, the Earth is here. And this stereo ahead spacecraft, which is moving ahead of the Earth, along the Earth's orbit, and the stereo behind spacecraft is moving behind, they're slowly separating from the Earth's position here, and they're currently sitting about 180 degrees apart, so that they, for the first time, provide, together with the SOHO and SDO spacecraft that I'll talk about in a minute, a 360-degree view of the Sun, which is obviously what you want to do if you want to see what's coming up uh, uh, on, the, on what's often called dark side of the Sun as it rotates into our field of view. We now know, courtesy of stereo, that it's not dark. <laughs> so, so you see an example here uh, with a three spacecraft providing you a really comprehensive view of, of the sun. I'll show you an application of stereo to space weather a little bit later. Uh, we, we, you couldn't really talk about space weather without mentioning uh, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which was launched last year. It's in geosynchronous orbit. 
And he does two things for space weather. The most important thing is to facilitate research. This is providing the most comprehensive information ever taken by anybody uh, of solar processes in the, in the corona and uh, at, the, at the solar surface with the objective to understand eruptions, to provide ability to forecast eruptions so that we can mediate space weather with longer lead times. In addition, it's a, it's a very useful space weather platform also, and I want to show you an example of that. Here's a movie. Uh, this doesn't do justice to the real SDO movies. Uh, if you look at those, they are 4K by 4K resolution. You need to string some monitors together to, to make that possible. But you can see lots of activity here. And you also see a flare here. This is in this wavelength, actually, this, this uh, Valentine's Day flare, as it's been called. And this, a CME was erupting from this region. If you know the region where the flare originated, it actually let, gives you a much better handle on the propagation direction uh, of, of the flare, which is an immediate benefit that you get from just looking at those images, and there are many more, more than I have time to uh, go into here. So moving on, another mission which has been a stalwart for space weather forecasting is the ACE mission here, which is sitting, also sitting at, uh, at the L1 point, just as SOHO. This is really the prime solar wind information source, even though it's as SOHO way past its design life. And, but it continues to provide full real-time coverage of the solar wind of the uh, particles that are coming from the sun in, in, in all energy bands, actually, uh, as well as the magnetic field that's carried by them. So that gives us a handle to predict uh, impacts, space weather impacts in geospace around the Earth with about a lead time uh, of half an hour to an hour depending on solar wind speeds. So this is a very unique capability uh, that uh, has been critical for, for space weather forecasting. Well, looking out into the future, and this was already mentioned yesterday, uh, RBSP is a key mission looking at space weather effects. It's, uh, it's a science mission aiming to study the radiation belt, how the radiation belts form, evolve, uh, what processes make them decay. But it provides beacon data, too. So in, in, if, you pro if you have the provision of appropriate downloads, uh, you can actually get real, uh, most of the time, get real-time information from these satellites telling you what the radiation belts are uh, at any instant of time. And that's a very, very useful thing that we can use for uh, incorporation into uh, advanced models, uh, such as assimilative models of the radiation belt. So this is, this is really the next step into the future of radiation belt uh, monitoring and research. Well, I, I showed you just a couple of examples here. There's much more, and I, I really uh, probably get in trouble uh, going, would get into trouble talking about all of them here. But many of the missions here of the, what, what we call the Great Heliophysics Observatory have space weather aspects either directly uh, through providing data in, in, in near real time or through providing very, very valuable science information that we need to understand all aspects of space weather better to enable better forecasting. Well, after you get the, if you get all the data, uh, you still want to predict into the future. Yeah? And one uh, very important way of doing that, perhaps the most important way of doing that, is by using models. And that's been recognized, of course, in the US government, uh, at NASA foremost, but also at other agencies such as NSF, the Air Force uh, Office of Scientific Research, and the Office of Naval Research. They, develop, they sponsor the development of models, by, by and large, in the scientific community that resolve scientific puzzles, and this thing is finally dead here. Okay, well I just talk, wave my hands. Resolve scientific puzzles uh, to model things like solar eruptions with the goal of predicting their impacts and then predict the space environment consequences in NASA's case not only near Earth but also at, at all other uh, venues of, of NASA interests such as planets. Okay, uh, and it has been, NASA has made a decision, and the decision is that models uh, that uh, have space weather relevance uh, are being shipped to NASA, to Goddard's uh, Space Weather Laboratory, my organization, the, the CCMC, in support of research, education, model testing and validation, which is very important, uh, space weather forecasting for NASA's robotic missions and other national needs. For example, we have a very close partnership with the Air Force Weather Agency uh, on sharing information. And you can generate products such as electric, uh, geomagnetically induced electric fields. This relates directly to what uh, Bill just said, as well as what we call the polar cap area. This is the area accessible to energetic particles from space uh, above the northern and southern poles. This is important for uh, 
communication outages as well as for polar uh, route operating airlines. So how do you use this information? I just want to show you uh, an example here. Come ba coming back to stereo and Soho, what you're seeing at the top, and I can't point to it, but you, the conveniently there are pointers on the slide, uh, showing you a time series of uh, uh, chronograph images on, on the stereo uh, ahead and behind spacecraft, top and bottom. I was showing you the eruption of a CME, and this is the famous April 3 event. Uh, and you see that growing as a function of time. In the, in the center, you see a similar time series from the Soro spacecraft, which also uh, detects this CME. Now, if you see such a CME in the observations, what you can do is you can fit those data to a model, to a very advanced model, and you can uh, in inject that information into the model to uh, generate a prediction uh, as to where that CME is going to be going. And we've been doing that uh, since 2006. It just, this was the really first big event. And here you see that. This is this famous CME which uh, impacted Earth two days later. And uh, by, is by some people attributed uh, 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 to the, to the uh, Galaxy 15 failure. So you see that a couple of times. You see the planets in there, which, which is very useful to have if you're predicting space weather for NASA missions. So uh, other information that you can, can develop using these models are a forecast for solar energetic particles. These are the very high energy particles that are hazardous to astronauts as well as to spacecraft. Uh, we have uh, two models uh, available there. One is developed in Spain, actually, an example of an international collaboration. This uh, doesn't work either. OK, and the, the other one is developed uh, by a person who's uh, moved from Southwest Research to NASA headquarters now, but uh, remains involved in this. And it predicts solar energy particles based on observations at the SOHO spacecraft. Moving on, yeah, I talked about data assimilation. This is really uh, perhaps the holy grail of space weather in the next uh, 10 years or so, which is uh, the art to incorporate intelligently measurements in space into advanced models in order to give you a better now cast, a better specification, and then based on that better specification, a better projection into the future. And one key example here, which is clearly going to play with the radiation belt storm probe missions, is this assimilative model here, which was developed at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, which takes data from, in, in this case, from uh, geostationary and, and GPS uh, missions, but then later from RBSP uh, to uh, generate a heretofore unknown quality of representation of the distribution of radiation in near Earth space. Well, you can move on to the ionosphere communication. Uh, is, is very important. Uh, there are models are producing that too. This is total electron content, which is important for, for uh, GPS as well. Uh, models like that and, and a va validation comparing to data also is a key issue. Neutral atmosphere here, you can take advanced models uh, that are running 24-7 and calculate heating, atmospheric heating rates, which uh, uh, relate to drag effects, uh, which, uh, which you want to be aware of if you're operating LEO spacecraft or the ISS. Uh, this will surely peak up as the solar cycle uh, will uh, grow further. Well, I, I want to briefly mention our development that we did at NASA Goddard here, which is to protect the power grid. Uh, Bill already talked about geomagnetically induced currents on the power grid. What we did was we strung together a chain of these advanced models, which are developed in the community but are running at Goddard, to create a new capability uh, to give you essentially a two time scale forecast or warning of uh, power grid if, uh, effects of uh, geomagnetic activity. The first uses a solar eruption, then a model that propagates that eruption through interplanetary space, the one I just showed you, in fact. OK, and then a probabilistic forecast based on the predicted impacts near Earth uh, for the power grid. And you see this forecast file, so, so a little faint on, on the lower right, which is then piped to the Electrical Power Research Institute, our partner institute on this endeavor, uh, and disseminated to the electrical power industry. And a, near ter a, a shorter lead term forecast, but with higher fidelity, obviously, is being generated using the A spacecraft again, which is seeing on the right, up on the top there. And you run a, uh, this advanced mo magnetospheric model, which we've been running since 2003, 24-7, 365. Uh, we, we generate currents that this model 
uh, generates in the Earth's upper atmosphere, these currents, these changing currents, induce uh, voltages in the ground, and these voltages can be used then to predict uh, uh, impacts on the power grid directly. And that information is also piped to the Electrical Power Research Institute and incorporated into their Sunburst research support tool, which is available to their constituency. Okay, uh, innovative dissemination, I, I kind of gradually slid, slid into dissemination. Um, what we developed at Goddard here, uh, sponsored by uh, NASA headquarters and then later by Goddard internal resources, is an innovative dissemination system, which I uh, invite you all to look at. Uh, the URL is at the top here. This gives you an unprecedented capability to bring together space weather information, whichever way you like on the web, uh, repeatable and completely configurable. And we moved on beyond that, and why am I showing you this boat? Not, not to convert you to be sailors, even though I love to do that, to, to be honest, but to make a point. The point is, you want, a space, uh, you want to be able to look at space weather whenever it's occurring, not only if you're sitting in your office in front of the computer. And uh, Chris already mentioned our iPhone app here, which I invite you to look at uh, on, the iPhone, uh, on the iTunes store. The logo is right here. Uh, if you find it, uh, it gives you in the, in the field space weather analysis capability. It also enables what we call the citizen scientist, anybody who's interested to look at space weather. Uh, and it will, uh, this summer, this fall, in fact, it will become available for Androids and, and special versions for tablets. So with that, conclusions, I think what I showed you here is uh, th uh, that even though NASA's SMD's missions and priorities are driven by scientific objectives, yeah, uh, these objectives include the goals to, to understand space weather, but even though I think it's clear that NASA missions provide key information, in fact the key information, to understand and forecast space weather. And with a growing need, uh, gr uh, with the growth of assimilative models with these new capabilities coming online, ingesting all available data streams uh, effectively is going to be even more important in the future. And I, I speak here for my NASA headquarters colleagues, uh, NASA is really proud of its contribution to space weather forecasting. And uh, we as an agency look forward to continued collaboration with our partner agencies uh, in the US as well as abroad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Now we're going to open it up for questions. Yeah. Our panel is looking forward to engaging you. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone? Gentleman in the green shirt. Two and a half questions, if I could. For Mr. Jones, um, that Venus orbit spacecraft, if you had two of them 180 degrees apart, would you cut your uh, analysis time in half? Uh, the people at uh, Ball did a, a graphical presentation of the results of having two spacecraft, and it cuts the search time to get to 90% of the 140-meter objects down to about two and a half years. From eight to two. So the point is, is that if you build two spacecraft, the second one's always cheaper than the first one. You know, you, you learn a lot about that, that uh, build, and you have uh, economies of scale, if you will. And we asked in our report to have NASA examine or analyze the cost benefit of having two spacecraft versus one. And uh, you do get faster results and a much more thorough search. You, your chart had said eight, so it goes from eight to two years. Yeah. And question two from Mr. Ahern. Um, what are the nuclear treaties right now for explosions in space, and how do you divert an object rather than break it up? Uh, okay, first, the first question, I was at a meeting on NEOs in St. Petersburg a year and a half ago, and one of our Russian colleagues got up and said, the first thing we have to do is outlaw the gravity tractor because it'll be too precise a weapon, but then we have to repeal both the Treaty on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty so that we can test nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in the US uh, pushing for repealing those treaties at the moment. Uh, but you would have to actually use nuclear weapons that would, would be a violation of the treaties if you wanted to deflect something. Uh, preventing breakup, uh, the important thing is to deliver momentum rather than energy. 
and it's probably best done by using a standoff blast that evaporates one side of the object and that transfers momentum. Now, if you have to do a very late deflection to deliver enough on a, on a relatively, well, depending on the size of the object, a late deflection requires delivering so much momentum that you deliver enough uh, energy that you may break it up and that's a worry because 10 one kilometer impactors are a lot worse than one three or four kilometer impactor. Fortunately, breakup usually goes to one big one and a lot of small mm -hmm. ones, but we said we don't trust that yet. And we don't, we advocate avoiding the breakup scenario until it, you're really sure that it's not going to make it worse. There's a non starter right now. Pardon? Using a nuclear weapon is a non starter right now because of the treaties. If we had a three-year warning of a large one coming in, I suspect that some country would use one in, regardless of the treaties. <laughs> Under UN agreements like that, you also have the right of self-defense. So if your nation is, is threatened, you would probably just take unilater unilateral action. And the key is find them early so you don't have to resort to a very energetic solution. And if you do find them early with a good search, then you can drop the the odds of using a nuclear one down to the one or two percent level. It would be nice to test and deploy before you had to do that. <laughs> All right, next question back over here. Over there. Yes, Rick Lopez with the LPAC. I wanted to um, ask you guys what you think about, we know that there are correlative relationships between seismic activity and uh, these cycles that you guys were bringing up um, outside of our Earth. And it seems to me that there sh given, given the huge earthquake that just hit Japan, that there should be research in not just understanding that there are correlations, because that could mean something or it may not mean anything, but try to understand underlying cause, which you know, may cause uh, both of these uh, cycles. And I'm wondering if, if what do you guys think of that kind of research so that we can not just look at um, solar activity, but, but try to understand how those processes relate to these cycles on our Earth that obviously have a big effect on us. Thank you. Bill, you want to take that? Yeah, the, this is on the list, yeah. The, uh, that, that issue actually has been looked at in, in, uh, for years now, the, uh, trying to understand the relationship between especially geomagnetic storms and seismic activity. There's been no, re no real good relationship established. There's ongoing uh, studies now to, to still trying to evaluate that and it comes up regularly, especially when we have these big earthquakes that do coincide with uh, outbreaks of solar activity and whatnot. But at this point in time, my um, response is there's, there's no relationship relationship that we, that we understand. Um, and, and outside of that area a little bit, the long-term solar cycles, there's, there's well-established relationships between those solar cycles and climate and whatnot. We've, we looked back at the Maunder minimum period between 1640 and 1715 when people were looking at the sun and recognized that there was practically no sunspots for that period of over 90 years, which coincides nicely with the uh, mini, uh, particularly cold part of the mini ice age. So when we, we, we map the sea surface temperatures and the air temperature with the solar cycles, they, they um, map out uh, nicely together. So we recognize that relationship, but outside of that, pretty difficult. I've seen papers and I've been in touch with people who try to define relationships between geomagnetic storms and the ups and downs of the stock market, <laughs> uh, stro you know, stroke and heart attacks and all oh sorts of things trying to uh, make those relationships. But at this point, I'm not seeing a whole lot. Next question. Oh, we have two of them right here, right next to you. Uh, this is George Davis with Emergent Space Technologies. Um, a lot of discussion recently on uh, hosted payloads um, on Iridium spacecraft, other second generation comm constellations. What types of payloads would have be of great, great interest to, uh, to NASA and NOAA for space weather data products? 
that has a whole option, of course, um, on, on hosted payloads. Um, the, the shooting of the calf, uh, one kind of payload that you could fly is an energetic particle sensor simply to provide additional uh, monitoring of uh, fluxes from aurora, from uh, uh, radiation bells, etc., etc. Uh, other opportunities would be imaging uh, sensors, for, for example, UV images to look at atmospheric scale heights and, and so on. Uh, on, on, on geo platforms, you can do perhaps do better. You, you could you could fly in, in addition to uh, radiation sensors. You could fly even perhaps imagers, uh, solar imagers, to look at the sun and, and in the way that I just described uh, regarding uh, the uh, the soul and, and, and stereo spacecraft. There's always a, a need for more data, and, and uh, I think hosted payloads are going to be. My personal belief is hosted payloads are going to be a key element of, of satisfying our nation's space weather needs if we, we start to take it as seriously as it appears to be in on the policy level. Mm -hmm. Young lady in the red. Do we have? Hi, Sarah James. Uh, and I can do this uh, One of the things that NASA extraordinarily good at, and more data than you imagine, as you talked about, Michael, as you talked about the models, and, and Bill, as you talked about the data that you guys do out in Colorado. Can we talk about how this partnerships that matters is coming up later this afternoon? What kind of partnerships have you engaged in? And how are you taking that data and translating it out to the functional communities so that there is an awareness? I'm loath to say public outreach because I'm going to listen public outreach. But can you, Dale and Michael, talk a little bit about what you're doing in the areas of functional user community stakeholder outreach? Um, yeah, that's, you know, I wish we had, a, like everyone else, more resources and an additional 50 staff to, to handle that very issue. Um, because of the growing customer base out there and the tremendous growing interest in space weather, uh, there, there's, a, there's a need for us to get out there and interact with these stakeholders as much as possible because we can obviously not provide the services that they need unless we fully understand what they need. So we've tried to do that, Sarah, as best we can. We Just on Tuesday, in fact, I was down with the three-hour visit with Dominion Power uh, to get a good sense for, for exactly what, what they need and what they're doing in response to, the, to our geomagnetic storm warnings to protect the grid in that large part of Virginia and other assets that they own. And we're bringing out key representatives from the electric power grid across the uh, continent, indeed, Canadian. We've got Hydro One from Toronto, Hydro Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Con Ed, and a whole bunch of them coming out in April to Boulder. So um, I'm just giving you one example of where we reach out to our um, stakeholder community to understand what it is they exactly need, what kind of lead time do they need to take the critical actions to protect the grid, to what degree of accuracy. We have to understand that, and from there we work with our colleagues like NASA and others then to introduce the, the research and modeling to help improve the forecast to reach those objectives. Good. Mike? Yeah, let me, uh, let, me, let me talk about the partnering aspect of what your question. I think partnering is, is, a, is a key element of, of conducting space weather in any form. Uh, well, I think it's very clear that the U.S. is, is in the lead and, and likely to stay in the lead in, in space weather research development and, and analysis. Uh, we can't do it alone. It's, it's very important that we uh, work with our friends in, in Europe, in Canada, in, 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 uh, in uh, Japan, in, in Russia, and, and, and other countries, as much as possible to exchange information so that we all end up doing a better job as a result. There's so much need to gather information, to just get information. We are not in a situation like uh, weather, where we have copious amounts of, of data sources uh, and still need to partner internationally, obviously. Uh, we are not. Uh, in, in space weather, we really have to uh, take call up international collaborations even more seriously. Uh, furthermore, of course, we, co we, we collaborate inside of, the, inside of the U.S. That's very clear. I already mentioned our collaboration with the Air Force Weather Agency in, in Omaha. Uh, and uh, with, with NOAA, of course, uh, with the Department of Energy with, with, and with other government agencies. I think that's very important uh, so that we all get the best result as, as an output. Okay. And 
Could you take the mic back there? While we're doing that, Mike, do you, do you have any thoughts on commercialization opportunities? Do you want to say anything about your thoughts on that? Oh, certainly, yeah. Uh, I think, well, we actually, uh, at, at uh, Goddard here, we have partnerships with a number of commercial, uh, nascent commercial uh, organizations in the, in the US to, uh, which want to use our, the information that we provide using our advanced systems uh, for commercial applications. And we are just, it's, I think it, it would be very, very helpful and very good for space weather for providing space weather information to the public in the best possible way if there were a viable commercial industry uh, playing a role in this. And I'm thinking about things like, in fact, if you don't mind me uh, pulling a sailing example here, uh, when I want to look at the overall weather, I look at the National Weather Service's website. But if I want to know what the wind is going to be like on the Chesapeake Bay, I pull up a website called Sailflow, which is operated by a commercial entity which takes National Weather Service information and tailors it to that specific need. And that's the kind of vision I think that we look, should look after when partnering with the commercial industry in, in, in space weather. Great. And last question back in the back. Yes, uh, this is related to the previous one, I guess, uh, and it's a two-parter. Um, one is um, it's, it's become evident that the data on space weather and in particular the solar cycle has kind of is, is continuing to confuse the public with regards to climate change and almost as if it's a either or thing either it's due to space weather or it's due to carbon emissions and and that's obviously not true um kind of a combination thing and in fact they exacerbate each other um i'm wondering if one have you considered um Actually, this is one part of it. Have you considered partnering with the folks at GIS who are studying climate change in your information dissemination, you know, dissemination clarification about this issue? And number two is um, this April conference that you mentioned might be a good opportunity since you're meeting with the power folks. Have you considered inviting the other scientists on the other side of the house to also participate to at least you know provide an information session on the folks that you've already established partnerships with regarding as an outreach opportunity to you know, inform the community about the the, the fact that uh, it isn't an either or situation that indeed uh, you know we are coming up on the maximum but then we've also got this background issue of of increased carbon does, does that make sense yeah go ahead Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you about our interaction with, with uh, Earth science in, in general. Uh, uh, being, at, being at NASA Goddard, uh, we had the advantageous situation that we can talk to uh, our colleagues in Earth science in, within the uh, Science Exploration Directorate uh, to essentially uh, exchange information on what we think is the right way to do, uh, to disseminate space weather and what their experiences are with what they have been doing, and they have a lot of experience. So this, this interaction has been extremely useful, and I, I predict it's going to continue to be extremely useful in the future uh, uh, to, to exchange this information, to make sure that we can uh, delineate very clearly you know, what is space weather, what is climate research, what is weather, and so on, and which one influences the other and which one does not. I think that's an educational uh, challenge that, that will clearly benefit from, from this interaction as, as will dissemination uh, to, to the public and to uh, in space weather interests in, in, in general. Well, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panel members for joining us here today and thank you to the audience. And thank you also to our moderator. Oh, thank you.